welcome to Video Gospel. Now this is going to be a little bit different than what we're used to doing in Video Gospel because I'm using a laptop that is set up with the recording device being farther away from me than what maybe the recording levels are used to doing. So if you can't hear it, we'll try to enhance it when we edit it. But Video Gospel really is just simply what we do with Video Ministry in presenting to you the gospel so that you'll think about those things that Jesus said. We know, supposedly, what the gospel is. The gospel is that idea of having good news. The good news is technically the fact that God has forgiven you through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. What that means is that somehow, some way, you already were headed to hell, no matter what you say or what you do. That's a fact, Jack. You may not like it, but the reality is, is that God, in his own way of determining, since he did create you, and the fact that you think that men and women can have babies without God being involved, just shows you how little you know about creation. But the fact that the creator is there at inception, means that there's three people involved whenever somebody is caused to become a living soul. That is, the seed from a man, the ovum from a woman, and God breathing life into that, joining together of those DNA and RNAs to create a living being. That living being grows up and finally becomes born and born of the flesh. Well, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. We know that the scriptures teach us that you must be born again. We know that which is born again also is translated as born from above. So, not to complicate things about the gospel, but do you really know what the gospel is? It's not simply only about the atonement, which is what we talk about in religious circles, saying, Oh, well, God died for your sins by being the Son of God and the Son of Man, by being fully man and fully God. He took the sins of the world upon himself, and being that he volunteered, he didn't die by people killing him, but rather he volunteered to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, and that he would be that example for all of us to follow after God, so that we no longer would be selfish, self-centered, and, you know, living after ourselves, but we would recognize that being forgiven of our sins, we would choose by love to follow after God. Right? Wrong. The gospel, the way it's presented today, is simply, hey, you know what? You're a sinner. Okay, well, yeah, you know, you're, you don't know how to control your life. Well, okay, yeah. So, you want to give God your life? Well, you, well, okay, if that's what you're saying, you know what I mean? I'll do it. You know, and so, a lot of times people will go forward in a salvation message, or they'll feel bad one day, and they'll say, oh, well, I want God today because I'm feeling horrible. And then as soon as things go right, they go left out there doing what they want to do. Is that the gospel we preach? Is that the gospel we teach? Is that the reality of what Jesus said? Hey, I bring you, or the angel said, I bring you glad tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. Born unto you this day in the city of David, a Savior. He will save his people from their sins. Now, I got news for you. Most of you think that the gospel is, and this is the record, that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life, but he who is not the Son of God has not life from First John. That's not the gospel. The gospel really was declared by the angel unto the earth that would be, for all peoples, that they would find a Savior. That they would get to know and discover a reality that Jesus is alive, Jesus is not dead, Jesus has something to say, and that the gospel is what Jesus is telling us to do, which really is boiling down to love. Now, I don't know about you, I know that I was told the gospel was, hey, you know, my sins are forgiven me. All I got to do is, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Is that the gospel? No. That's what God is saying or Jesus is saying about his father. He's saying it with the word for because he's talking about what happened before that statement. So I don't know how to tell you this, but the gospel really isn't just simply the idea that, oh, 
Jesus died, Jesus rose, and now I can, you know, have my sins forgiven and go about and who knows what I'm going to do after that. That's what we like to say. Grace is, you know, that you have somehow, by faith, you've gone out and you've used this certain formula. You know the secret formula, you know, the secret recipe for gospel. There is a secret recipe to the gospel that, you know, Christians use in order to justify the fact that they don't know whether or not they are saved. You know, we have the, quote, assurances that we have. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all righteousness. So we profess with our mouth that Jesus has risen from the dead and, you know, it's imputed to us from righteousness. So we, we do all these things that we've read about in the scriptures on the one hand. But on the other hand, did God tell me that I'm saved? Did God say, hey, save, like Jesus did to the guy dying on the cross? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Why? Because Jesus could see his heart, and God knew, Jesus being God, the Son of God, knew that the man wanted Jesus more than anything else in life, even though he's dying. What can I say? So, Jesus forgave him. Jesus justified him. Jesus claimed him, and Jesus took him to heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like Jesus has a lot to do with salvation. You see, I'm not going to try to put a criteria on it and say, well, you know, we have this certain formula that's right, but I'm not going to tell you that everyone that says the right methodology, well, you know, we got to profess with our mouth, we got to do this, that, and the other thing, and have the salvation prayer, is saved. Sorry, I don't see it that way. You see, I see people that get saved frankly, go off on a tangent and no longer talk to God about being saved daily or having that salvation as a process working out in their lives. You see, Christians want to use the word sanctification, set apart, to be the process of salvation, that once you're saved, then sanctification is God working on you to bring about set apart for the world or set apart for his purposes. Either way, you get one, a methodology, the other, a purposeful, driven, or purpose-driven life. Both mandate a certain responsibility on our part to have a personal relationship with God. What that all boils down to, what it means is simply that we've confused the gospel with so many other things. We want to make sure that you're doing it right. We want to make sure you really mean it, so we add all these prayers to it. We add all these steps to it. We had all these things to it. God didn't do that. Jesus, presenting the gospel to his disciples, said, Hey, follow me. Boom! Say, None of those which the Father has given to me into my hand will I lose, save him who was already afore mentioned, that he would be condemned and would technically choose to be condemned, but you know, Satan, Satan would enter his heart and that he would no longer be fit for God's purposes and God would condemn him to hell, which was Judas. But other than that, anyone that's sitting here right in God's own hands, Jesus' hands, he wouldn't lose. Now, Jesus had a lot of people that followed him. There were 70 and 120 and then there were thousands. But you see, the 70 and the 120 and the thousands, they all left him one day. They left him when he said, Eat my body, drink my blood. <coughs> Say what? Do what? I don't think so. I'm out of here. I don't care if you're Lord. I don't care if you're God. I don't care what you say. I'm out of here. I'm not going to eat your body, man. I'm not no, you know, heathen. I'm not no, you know, uh, headhunter. You know, I don't eat flesh. I don't drink blood, you know. I don't even care if it's a Catholic thing. Transmutation and all. But the reality of what happened with that, there was something that came up in every one of those pure person's life that confronted them in their quote-unquote salvation experience that they no longer wanted to be saved. They left, except for the disciple, who hung around, not quite sure what to do or where to go, but everybody left, and so they could have gone with the popular thing to do. They could have followed the party line. 
they could have gone with the people, for the people, and by the people, and split, because Jesus said something that was going to go against everything they understood. And yet, whoosh, at that moment in time, the Holy Spirit came down. And he rested upon Peter, and Peter makes his famous declaration. Well, you know, Jesus looks at him and says, well, are you going to leave me too? And he says, well, where we go? You have the words of eternal life. And Jesus says, hey, you know, you don't know this, but that's from my father. Because I think Jesus was sorrowful at that moment, because he knew that the people didn't get it. They didn't understand what the gospel is. The gospel is a relationship that you are being entered into to have a marriage between you, God, and the Son. That's by the way of the Spirit, so it's kind of like four in one, so to speak. But really, it's just body, soul, and spirit, meaning that the Spirit of God comes within you, and you're kind of like having this relationship with God in a way that you don't understand the oneness of God. But see, here's how it is explained. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Now, I don't know what that means. You don't know what that means. And we know that no matter how we go about it, we're not going to know what it means. We can say that it's this, but not that, and that is this, but this is still, and whatever it be. We need use that stupid triangle that says this, but not that. God said you can't understand it. You won't understand it. My thoughts aren't your thoughts, neither are my ways, neither am I able to be understood. The Spirit is a whole lot more different than God the Father, and believe me, we get into the Spirit of God and people start talking presence instead of person. I start going, uh, wait a minute, what do you mean presence? I'm sorry, but if God is present, he's present in the person of the Holy Spirit, not in the presence of the Holy Spirit. See, there's a difference. But they got this word of presence, and now they make it into an object rather than the verb of the presence of God being there and that God had arrived by his arrival of being a person arriving and that he is now present, present tense. God knows those Pentecostals, they'll come up with something. But my perspective of teaching you about the gospel and medieval gospel is simply this. It's about Jesus. What did Jesus say he's about? His gospel, the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, is that I have come to reveal my Father, and my Father loves you, and he knows you, and I want you to know my Father, that you might follow my father as I follow him. You follow me, I follow him, bingo, we got it. So, frankly, really, if we got down to the brass tacks of what the gospel is, it's about knowing God, bottom line, knowing Jesus as God, the Son of God, the Son of Man, and learning that by way of the Spirit, making that our gospel. You see, I'm not out there to tell people, hey, you know, let me save you from your sins, tell you what I'm going to do. On the one hand, you're going to hell. On the other hand, you're going to heaven. Let me give you heaven no matter what it takes. And so I make up all these ways of getting saved. And maybe you are, but maybe you aren't. In other words, somebody has to impute that righteousness. You don't get it just by saying it and doing it. I'm sorry. It's not a automatic magic formula. It's not a program that you just type it into the computer, press a button, and bingo, you're saved. No, I'm sorry. No matter how you look at the book of Revelation, when you look at the letters to the seven churches, there's still the idea that Something went on in your life that you no longer were doing what you wanted to do, but you were doing what you were told to do. You see, I like this idea of looking up, because it means you're not looking around and you're not looking down. You're looking up, and you're listening to and seeking and following after what God wants you to do. God doesn't want you to save the world. You can't. You're not going to. I got news for the abortion Nazis. You know, there's a lot of Nazi abortion people out there that want to stop abortion no matter what it takes. They're out there. They're not necessarily Christian about it. They will kill doctors. They will pray that doctors go to hell. They will stop, you know, the parties that are involved with abortions no matter what it takes. But they will not save the doctor that's committing the abortion. They will not pray for his salvation. They will not pray for the person who's having abortion salvation. They will save babies. Oh, we got to save the little ones, you know. Because after all, they're going to heaven, you know. 
Do babies go to heaven? Do all babies go to heaven? No. Any more than all people that say, Oh, I want Jesus, are going to heaven. God said, I would be found if they would seek me with all of their heart. Jesus said, No one who comes unto me will I reject, but you got to come unto me. Jesus said to his disciples, sitting at a table, follow me. And he got up and followed. The reality of the gospel isn't simply a one-time act, but it's a available means with which God is making to you the foundation stone of something that's a reality that has to be occurring in your life, which is a personal relationship that has begun with the idea of asking him to reveal himself to you and to live with you and to abide in you. As much as this is my home where I live, God wants to come into your home and to go right there where you live. 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 Right where, you live. where do you live? I mean, come on. If God isn't everywhere in what you're doing and isn't involved in everything you're doing, you're not saved. What are you saved from? What are you saved to? What is the gospel? The good news is that you're supposed to have a personal relationship with God. You're supposed to be developing by way of the Spirit of God, who is connected with God, a connection that is continually growing in you that becomes more in knowing about God the Father and having intimate conversation, interlocution, as it were, of the communication abilities that you should have in hearing God speak. Hey, Lord, your servant listens. And having Jesus come to you as a priest and cleansing you from without and from within. Because the spirit inside brings out of your mouth the things that God would love to hear from you. Praise, worship, adoration, thanksgiving. You know, all those things where you say, hey, thank God I'm alive. Thank God he's given me another day of breathing. Thank God there's a God in heaven that takes care of me. Thank God God will protect me. Thank God God will do all these things for me. But God does them for you. If you're doing them by way of declaration, you're making yourself out to be a God. I declare that I am this, that I am that, and I am perfect, and I am God, and I got my power from God, but I'm the one who's doing it. Because I've been given authority. That's not what God meant by giving you authority. I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. You make yourself out to be a king, you'll fall as a king. You make yourself out to be you know, perfect, you'll fall as perfection. You'll stand before a holy and just God and God say, hey, show me your perfection. I'll show you mine. No, it doesn't look like Jesus to me. So frankly, what is the gospel? Where do we go from here? How do we find out what the gospel is? Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall knock, and the door shall be open. In other words, you can go to one of those concerts and run forward and get your salvation experience. Or you can just simply say, God, whatever it takes, Whatever you need to do, save me. Or just simply, Jesus, help me. Jesus, I need you. That's it. You don't need to make it into anything bigger or lesser. But what you need to do is to make it daily. In other words, the gospel is not a one-time event. It is an ongoing process whereby you are developing in your relationship with God that perspective of knowing that at any moment, whoo! God could zip you right out of life. The providence of God is such that he has allowed you this continual time to develop a personal relationship with him so that you go on in life doing what he wants you to do so that when it comes time to bring you home, so to speak, maybe God doesn't want you in heaven. Maybe you are so earthly stink that God doesn't want you anywhere near heaven. In other words, do you think that someone who's so full of carnality and sin without Jesus being within that somehow is going to get into heaven? C.S. Lewis wrote a book about the great divorce and it was about a train ride going up into heaven. I don't remember which the, the name of the, the short stories was, but it was about a train ride going to heaven and that somehow those that were coming out of the earth were going to heaven and that it got brighter and brighter and brighter, so bright that they were blinded because they were still in sin. The grass was so sharp that it cut their feet. The music was so loud that it was deafening to them. Where others that went, they walked on soft, supple grass. The light was beautiful and golden, you know, and they saw it as glorious. The music they heard was falling softly on their ears. Two different perspectives. Reality of that which is 
according to heaven is heavenly minded. That which is according to flesh is fleshly minded. Politicians are politically minded. Christians are supposed to be Jesus minded or Christ minded, meaning that they're looking to and developing in themselves, how can I crucify myself more to the world than put the world in me? And that's what the problem is with a lot of Christians. I mean, I'm going to tell you specifically people like, you know, well, anyways, in the political arena, all the Christians that are out there, that you know who they are, you know, that are standing up as political activists that are trying to make the world a better place to live in. Why? It's going to be renovated. That's not what your purpose here is. Your purpose here is to know Jesus, preach Jesus, teach Jesus, learn about Jesus. And the fact is, you don't even really need to go out and save people. God will save them because of what your relationship is. People will be so excited they want to have what you got. So why go out to save people from abortion when you could save people for eternity? In other words, hey, it's not your place to do things on your own. It is your place to be owned by, led by, taught by, and following by the Word of God, meaning that God spoke to you today and said, hey, get up, go out, and do your job. You we're told that, that means you got up, you got cleaned up, and you went to your job, meaning your physical job that God put you in, that you prayed about getting the job you're in, you asked God to do and lead you, you asked God to give you a job that you could provide for yourself and provide for your family and take care of other people and use a portion of that, you know, to minister to other people in their poverty so that you in your prosperity could be a minister of the grace of God that you've been given and that if God caused the increase, you would obviously pass it around to those around you. So that being such is that God would send you onto and make your way to prosper so that you could be even more so manifesting the love of God to other people by way of your vocation. So that way your application and your profession would be true. Your calling and election would be such that God would say to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But how can he say it to you if you don't even know he's your master? I don't know. Welcome to the gospel. It is about doing what God has said to do, not about getting free tickets and free rides from hell on earth to heaven where God dwells.